Did you know that 70% of businesses fail within the first five years? How do you avoid joining this business graveyard? Learn from other business owners who have overcome major challenges and gone on to run thriving businesses on the I Survived Business Podcast. If you're an aspiring or active business owner, tune in now to hear their can't-miss inspiring stories. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the I Survived Business Podcast. My guest is Carl Becker. He's the author of a book called Set Up to Win. His website is improvingsalesperformance.com. So we're going to talk about uh, how he helped companies through his consultancy and some of the lessons he's learned along the way. So, Carl, thank you for coming. Yeah, really glad to be here. And I love the topics you explore. I think they're super helpful. Yeah. Some of them I wish I knew about before I got into business. So that's the goal here. But um, tell me a bit about your background and how you came to be a consultant. Thank you. You know, all my life, I think I've been one of those people that might consider themselves a creative or maybe an accidental business person or something like that, where, you know, as a little kid, I loved ideas. And I think some of that came from the fact growing up, I never really fit in very well. For example, just learning traditionally was really hard for me. And later as an adult, I found out I have stealth dyslexia, which kind of looking back, I go, oh, no wonder I, I kind of had to learn in non-traditional ways by seeing the world and mapping it together and and relying on context, re- relying on human connection to learn and to understand and to grow. So ever since I was a little kid, I've always been, you know, hey, what if we had a business like this? You know, what if we did this? What if I invented this, mom? And, you know, as I grew up, I got more involved in just like starting businesses. And I realized that selling was about bringing ideas forward. There's a huge creative element to you know, bringing an idea forward, whether it's your own or someone else's and get someone to go, yeah, I'm enrolled with that. I want to do that. That sounds great. You know, from a funny point of view, you probably have friends that could convince you to go to Vegas. It's kind of the same thing. There's this big idea. Do you want to go along for the ride with me? So ever since I was a, a little kid, I've been into business and creating ideas and bringing them forward. And and I have had a very bumpy road. I am a student of hard knocks while I, I have a degree and I have an MBA. I would say where I am today is because I've just been out there doing stuff, getting beaten up, learning. And and I think the natural progression was, hey, can I take those learnings, share them with other people? And hey, all of a sudden you're an author or a speaker or a consultant, which I do. All right. Well, tell me about some of the knocks, the bumps, you know, what is going to be instructive for others to listen to. So, yeah, I will tell you one of the ones that shows up for me right away is I was running a digital agency, had done it for about 10 years, more or less from 2000 to 2010. And you, when I started it, I didn't have any money. And so I was like, okay, who do I know that's a developer, a designer, somebody somebody that's in this tech space that's emerging? Because I'm really good at sales and project management, putting things together. And I ended up getting introduced to this this guy who later became a very good friend of mine. His name is Ian, and he was 18 years old. He was at, I live in Boulder, Colorado, so he was at, at CU, and he had dropped out of school, engineering school, and he was the assistant manager at a hot dog place called Mustard's Last Stand, for any of those of you in Colorado listening. And we became really good friends. And what was great about that at the early time was, you know, he moved into my house. That was a way we could save money. We bootstrapped everything. We would carpool. We would, you know, he lived in my house. We would, you know, eat at home instead of spending money just to grow this business which was all great. We started to do amazing work, got recognized nationally, internationally. We were even at South by Southwest for a few years as finalists sitting next to like companies like Hulu that had just ramped up. But what I wasn't aware of, and this is the lesson learned, is that Ian just wanted to do really cool stuff. Like he was a creative through and through. And while, yeah, he wanted to make a, a living, he cared less about the living and growing the business, you know, building to sell and more about how do I do really cool things? How do I like reimagine the digital space. Meanwhile, me, I just finished my MBA, had a young family. I wanted a house. I wanted a family. I wanted to be able to like sell this company or merge it into something else. And for many years, it it was okay because we were growing so rapidly. But as we started to become more and more mature and do higher and higher ticket work, if you will, we would build apps. We built the first mobile phone app for the Porsche brand here in the United States. I realized every single project we were losing money on. And the only reason we were growing and that we could pay our bills is I kept selling and he kept building product, product. And the team loved the work they did. But every time we would scope it, boom, the next month we'd be way over budget and we were losing money all the time. And what I realized is we had two companies in one company. We had two visions, a vision of making really cool things 
and a vision of trying to make a profitable business that you know created product market. So fast forward a little bit, we all know what happened 2009, 2010. I had a ton of real estate development clients and big ad agency clients, and my pipeline literally froze. I didn't have yeses and I didn't have noes. I had a whole bunch of maybes and you can't pay your bills on maybes. That's a lesson right there. But the bigger lesson was, oh my gosh, we've got a company that's not focused. Where are we going? You know, are we just building really cool stuff or are we building a profitable business? And ultimately I, I closed that business down, declared bankruptcy and reinvented myself. And from that day on, I knew, you know, if I'm not clear on vision, the destination we're going and everyone else on board isn't enrolled in that, there's a tremendous risk of, of you know, if we were a sports team, we, would, we were losing against ourselves. So that's the lesson. Like if you've got some partners, maybe it's a family member. And if you're not all on the same page, the sooner you get there, the more you're going to de-risk your company and also most likely start to become more and more successful because focus is so essential to anything, especially business. Yeah, but even if it's just you, how do you make sure that there's not a dichotomy going on in your own head where you need to make money, but you're just so interested in doing cool stuff or exactly. you're just overextending yourself in some some wrong way. So you add odds with yourself. Absolutely. That's another good point. And you know, if you are that person, a mentor, you know, a peer group, something like that where You've got people that care about you that can check you because I think entrepreneurs, we're all really scrappy. We're smart. We're intelligent. We want to make things happen, but sometimes we're really blind to what might be obvious for someone else. So what are some other mistakes that you've made that were pretty significant? Yeah. So there's another one that's burned into my brain. And I just mentioned peer groups. I'm in a peer group, big organization called Vistage. And I had another company. So after I closed that business, I, I was kind of an entrepreneur at a couple of companies and took some of the success there and parlayed it into another company that did more or less uh, outbound lead generation. Uh, for those of you in the sales world, I ran like a sales development rep company. And while we would do some inbound, most of our work was outbound. It was like trying to figure out our right message for our clients, bring that message to a target audience and get that target audience to raise their hand and want to engage in conversation, which would hopefully lead to some sort of business opportunity. Well, I had built a ton of systems and processes and, you know, we'd have some clients that were doing really, really well and others that were really marginal. And side note, this is actually how Set Up to Win got generated. But the lesson learned is I am frustrated. I'm this entrepreneur, and maybe you're like me. I'm working at night all the time, weekends all the time. And you would hear me say things like, I'm the only one that can do this. I'm the only one that can solve this, stuff like that. So I'm in my peer group, and I can remember this vividly. They, they asked me to process my issue. And my issue was, why can't the team do this work? Why can't they follow... Now, the systems I made, why can't they do what I can do? And well, the short answer is they're not a clone of me. And, you know, we've got to surrender to team and strategy and, and kind of figure that out. But I was blind to that at that moment. So I'm up at the whiteboard and I'm, I'm writing like up the big, the big things I want to process through and what I'm challenged with. And I say something to this whole group, like, and I'm the only one that can do this. And a couple of them kind of chuckle, kind of like gently, friendly. And others look at me really seriously and they're saying, could you repeat that again? And I was like, I'm the only one. No one can help me. And I'm like ranting. I'm so frustrated. And very calmly, the chair who ran the peer group, still does, said, Carl, you know, do you really believe you're the only one that can do this? And as soon as he said it, and I kind of said it back to myself, I realized that was kind of not true. And then he said, I really think you need to surrender to team and strategy. Like you're never going to be bigger than you are. You're never going to have work-life balance until you surrender to team and strategy until you get really intentional about what you want to do and empower the people around you with clarity and purpose and the tools to do their job and let them do what you hired them to do. And it was kind of like this big punch in the gut. I was like, oh my gosh, right? But if you think about it, how many of us say that? We feel like we have to hero through this thing. We are the only ones. We have to put in the extra hours or, you know, here they are. They messed up again. And I guess my lesson learned is, you know, what is my role a lot of times in the success of the company, the failure of the company, the challenges of the company? And if I'm not seeing that the teams that I run or the teams that I coach are solving problems, and it's up to one person, then typically there's something much deeper going on that we can fix. I mean, that's the good news, right? We can fix it. We can start to figure out how to team better, bring people together. But the big lesson learned was, you know, I, I can't spend my life heroing through this. I can't spend my life thinking I'm the only one that can do this because I'm just going to put myself in a really tough place more times than not. No life balance mistakes. I'm going to get burned out. I'm not going to take care of myself physically, mentally. And it's a way to crash. A lot of people think that, but they go back and forth. Like they think, oh, I'm the only one that could do this. Then they're like, all right, 
and they try to get someone else to do it. And maybe they're not good at management or systems or procedures or setting up a scaffold for that person to be able to do it effectively because they're not them. And then they say, see, only I can do it. And then they go back into the cycle. How do you break out of that? Like first, it sounds like the recognition of, I can't do everything or I'm never going to grow. But then the second part, how do you empower people so that they can do what you do or at least pieces of it effectively? Exactly. And this is so tricky. And I've been caught in this trap more times than I can count probably. So, you know, if you were a client and we were working together, the first thing you nailed it, you know, we've got to have a self-awareness that if, if we don't, you know, what is our role? If we don't start to shift how we are in our own companies or our own teams, you don't have to be an entrepreneur. I mean, this could be you're running your own team. There's plenty of managers out there have the same problem. First, you have to have some of that awareness, right? And then I think you have to determine, are you willing to change and know that most change takes time and it, you don't get it right first. And just because you have the idea, you you birth this idea doesn't mean it's it's going to go to fruition. You need to kind of create a change management plan, if you will. So once you kind of get your head straight, and a lot of times if I'm, I'm working with somebody, it's just talking through that. And then I like to kind of think, okay, who, who on the team can, can do this? And if they can't, why not? Kind of a gap analysis. Where do we want to go? What's our current state? What's the challenge? And a lot of times, I hate to say this, but it is the leader. The leader hasn't Maybe they're very visionary or they jump really fast. They move faster than other people. So a lot of this is ourselves as leaders taking a minute and going, okay, how do I change? And how do I start to partner with my teammates and ask them how they would solve it? What type of time they would need? What type of resources? What are the check-in points? What don't you understand? But it gets back to just really learning about, about the situation and the team you have and getting into conversation. Again, those things that I'm saying are about building team, building your teaming muscle. And it is scary because they are going to fail. And so that's why I think you have to check yourself. So the first part I would just say is like, check yourself. Second one is get into conversation, get intentional, get deliberate, be patient. And then the other one is like, allow people to make mistakes. Uh, hold the meeting space when you're interacting with them for, for some forgiveness and coaching. And then also try to find some quick wins. Find, find some things where people can win and you can trust them and build that kind of muscle up within your organization. Don't go for the crazy, gnarliest thing out of the gate because at that point you might create that self of a reality, right? Uh, here we are again, but it is tra tricky. But once you do it, it gets addictive when you start to see your team win. It, it's kind of like being a proud parent or like your favorite sport team's winning. You're getting excited about what's going on. What's something that you're really good at? I think very, other few, very few other consultants are good at yeah. in terms of solving problems in business. And I'm not telling you to brag, but yeah. I think everyone you know, has like a big overlap in what they can do, but everyone's also has like a real zone of brilliance. So that's why I want to ask you about that. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think what shows up for me first is kind of how I started us talking, right? I had to learn how to be in the world differently because traditional learning environments didn't work for me. So I think I got really good at meeting people where they were. And because just even almost from a survival point of view, uh, I didn't feel like I fit in. A lot of the people I met were also kind of outsiders. So I, I got really good at learning and appreciating different types of people, bringing kind of this understanding of finding value and connection with all different types of people in all different types of situations. And so I think at some level, I have that level of empathy and understanding just naturally, where I look to bring out the best in people because I'm always looking for connection personally. Like I want to find a thing that we can connect on. I think second, I have been an entrepreneur ever since I was selling Girl Scout cookies with my sister, pushing a lawnmower around the summertime, knocking on doors, seeing if I could mow a lawn to a whole slew of companies. And there's been wins and there's been failures and there's been heartbreak and there's been bankruptcies and also really great wins and great friendships. So for me, I think I've sat in every seat. I'm the type of person that, you know, I'm not going to ask someone to do something I wouldn't do myself. And so I think it's kind of this combination of seeking to understand others and also this combination of having done a lot of different things and had been in a lot of difficult situations that I can bring a variety of different perspectives to an engagement. So I'd like to think, you know, when I'm working with someone, my strength comes from a, this kind of holistic view, being able to shift gears. If we need to talk about sales, talk about sales. We need to talk about teaming. We talk about team. We need to talk about finance. We talk about finance. But I think at the root of it, it is I'm patient and I like to really seek to understand. And from there, possibility gets created. And so I think I'm somebody that is always looking for the possibility versus looking for the the bad, gnarly, nasty stuff. I'm trying to find the good stuff and uh, move a company forward that way. Where do you think a lot of entrepreneurs screw up? Is it being perfectionist? Is it comparing themselves to other companies? Is it uh, 
laziness? Is it lack of systemization? Like what are the top issues yeah. that people have? You know, I think one that I have fallen into and still triggers me sometimes is I think more times than not, entrepreneurs associate success with money. And, you know, there's a lot of successful nonprofits. There's a lot of successful lifestyle businesses. There are a lot of successful businesses where the founder, the entrepreneur is playing for team health, you know, being able to provide jobs for people, maybe even a family owned business. It's less about, you know, how fancy of a car I have, how big is the exit. But yet I think as entrepreneurs, we get kind of sucked into this a lot because of the media, right? You look at the, the shows, it's all about the quick exit. How much money did you make? But, you know, if, if we kind of get to what's what's the normalization of being an entrepreneur, it's a lot of hard work. It's doing what you love. It's making a difference. It's creating something that didn't create before, that wasn't created before, a better way. And that's the win when you solve that, not how much money did you make at the exit. So I think a lot of times we compare ourselves to other entrepreneurs, much like an athlete, right? If you love tennis and you're 45 years old, you're never going to be a pro tennis player, but can you still enjoy tennis? Right. Or something like that. And and I think that's kind of the big trap that I fall into. And unfortunately, when you go to conferences or things like that, who do they bring up as the keynote speaker? You know, the person with the big exit. And I look around the room, I'm like, you know, all of our making change as a leader or an entrepreneur, let's talk about somebody, something that's real. Let's get somebody on stage that's talking about something real and their real journeys and empowering these people to realize they, they can do something that impacts their own life and that of their family. So I, I would say that's a big one. Happy to share a couple others, but I don't know if there's other questions you might want to talk through. Well, when do people feel like they're truly successful in business? Is it, it, it sounds like it's rarely money. So, you know, what if you had a lineup of speakers and you're like, all right, you're allowed to talk about one thing that makes you feel like you're successful, but it cannot be the money you make. It's got to right. be something else. Like, what would the speakers say in your experience? Right. You know, what I would say is I have a new book called Iceberg Selling. And the whole idea of that book, it starts out with, Hey, salespeople, people that are selling, you're great. You make a difference in the world, right? If you're selling, you are helping generate revenue for companies. You're helping companies grow. You're making payroll. And if you know, you're know you successful, maybe you are helping pay for your kid's college or you're you know, taking care of your parents or you know, you're putting, if you celebrate Christmas, you're putting you know, Christmas presents under the Christmas tree type thing, right? Like you're making a difference because you can't have kind of this expandable bandwidth. But the other part of that book, as soon as we kind of talk through, hey, being in sales is really great. It's what are you playing for? And I really would like that to sink in anybody listening. Like, what are you playing for? And it might be money. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I, my guess is you were playing for something else. You were playing for independence to impact the world. If you, you know, you're in medicine, maybe it's to cure a disease. If you're in a product that might be like green, green energy or something like that, you're in it to change the world, to educate people, to make a difference. So, you know, I, I think it's really important to get cleared out only on your mission. Like, what, why, why did you do this? Not only your mission for your company, but this is what I think entrepreneurs often miss is what is your own why? Why did you do it for yourself? A lot of entrepreneurs, you know, we always taking care of everyone else. And I think a lot of times we don't realize, hey, what feeds me? And so for me, I would want to see somebody on stage that says, hey, I started this business because... I wanted to change the world or change this thing or conquer this thing. And, you know, for me, my personal win was blank. And so every day as I grew this business, I played for that. I actually had a really great experience a couple of days ago at a conference where somebody that ran a nonprofit came in and kind of talked about how they grew that nonprofit and the outcome and the jobs they created for different types of the population, people with handicaps. And it was super powerful because that's what he was playing for. And that's what he was playing for for himself as well. So I, I think it, it, it's so personal, but at the end of the day, you got to figure out what your own mission is. Why are you there? What are you playing for? So what have you seen as uh, your current consultancy? What are some of the, uh, I don't know, the things you have to do over and over and over again with people in the beginning, since the first month you work with them? Yeah. So the, the one I think I see so often, and since I'm mainly in the sales marketing arena, I'm a sales and marketing consultant. I come in and build sales organizations. I mean, so does my team and we run workshops and things like that, is I think there's this myth out there that there's this shortcut to revenue. I'm going to do this one thing, and it's all going to work out. So the first thing I like to kind of talk through is, wait a minute, you know, like you got to put in the work, you got to do the frameworks, you got to do the foundations. That's what my book set up to wins about. It's like, hey, how do you start to build the frameworks and foundations so that you can crawl, walk, run, or run faster, or walk faster, whatever it is for you as a business owner. But oftentimes I come in, 
And there's just a lot of lack of foundations. It could be as simple as, do you have a clear accountability chart? Like who's supposed to do what? Is it clear? Has it been communicated? Has it been agreed to? And when it comes to, you know, selling, a lot of times I like to go in and ask a company kind of, hey, if I talk to 10 people randomly, how do we create value? Am I going to get the same answer? And if that leader scratches their head and like, I'm not sure, then those are usually hints that until we try to put our foot on that accelerator, we've got to do some of the hard work, the intentional work. The other one that I would tell you is a lot of people, especially in sales, and when you talk to marketing and leaders that aren't doing sales, they think everybody that walks in the door is ready to buy. Um, they think everybody's at that bottom of the funnel, like, oh, you know, are you ready to buy? What's your budget? How soon? And I got to tell you that my reality is more times than not, most of the people that are interested in working with you, they're much earlier in their decision. They want to learn more about you, how you can solve their problems. And it's a, it's a much slower dance than we want it to be to move them to a place where they're like, yeah, you create value. This is what I want. I'm ready to go. So I'd say it's, it's two things. Okay. One quick question in terms of comparing yourself to other businesses, like, you know, I, I guess I have problems. I would look at other businesses in my industry and be like, wow, they look so much more successful than me. What am I doing wrong? What, what's wrong with me? But then a friend told me, he's like, look, you, you can't see inside their businesses. You don't know their bottom line. You don't know their profit margin. You don't know that they're like five minutes away from bankruptcy, which helps. But still, I have that tendency to want to compare. I don't know if that's a phenomenon with your client, but if so, how do you manage that? Yeah, I don't see it necessarily all the time. Usually they are pretty clear on the game they're, they're winning, the game they want to play and the game they want to win. But I do think there's always kind of this, well, I saw this thing. I listened to this podcast. I read this, this guy in my peer group, my neighbor, whatever. And, you know, I would just say all businesses are very, very different. Margins are different. How we sell is different. There's core kind of components. But just if you look at top line, like, you know, imagine we sold cars, right? It could be pretty easy to do a million dollars in revenue if we sold cars. But if we sold, you know, $10 boxes of cookies or something like that, it's going to take a long time to get to a million dollars. So I, I think, you know, some of it is just helping people check themselves and realize that. And when I do run into it, it's usually a heart to heart of back to kind of what I said before. Like, why are we comparing ourselves? I mean, if we're comparing ourselves apples to apples and we know there's like some key baselines or you know, best practices, that's one thing. But to just kind of compare one business to another, I just don't think it's it's even close to apples to apples. And so sometimes it's just talking out loud, I find, is, you know, talking through it. And quite frankly, usually it's something underneath that. Like, why are we comparing? What is it really going on? Maybe that owner is struggling with revenue or they thought they would have an exit or a client didn't pay and they're worried about payroll. It's usually something else. So I guess I would say there's a two-part answer. One is like, kind of just check yourself and, and ask yourself, uh, is it really apples to apples? And second, there's probably something else going on that's giving you that anxiety if you're going, you know, I'm just not as good. Uh, why isn't my company doing the same thing as, you know, this other person's? My guess is there's something underneath that might be a root cause. And if you start to fix that, you're going to be less concerned about comparing yourself because your own business is going to be healthier. Okay. What do, what do entrepreneurs or clients tell you they want when they first work with you? Like what's common? Versus what they actually need. I don't know if they, the two jive told that they want. Well, I'll tell you this much, you know, over the years I've realized if an entrepreneur comes to me and they just want revenue, they just want to go from 10 to 20 million or from 1 million to 5 million. And that's all they're obsessing about. They're usually not a good fit for me. And the reason I say that is what I play for is I like to build really strong, high performing, healthy sales teams with strong cultures where we're building for the long term. We're bringing out the best in people. And we're, we're trying to understand our customers fully and back to kind of the whole concept of an iceberg. I think most people, you only see about 10% above. So if you want to sell really well, I, I'm always encouraging people to look at the 90% below. And when we do that, we can bring value. So if I can get an entrepreneur to move from, hey, I just need to be a rocket ship and have an exit to, hey, what are you really playing for? Do you really just want to really solid team that you're proud of with a strong culture and know that as we understand our customers' icebergs more and we can provide solutions that are a fit, then the byproduct of that, the byproduct of value is revenue. It's an exchange of services. And the better we create value, the more profitable we are to the bottom line. If I can get an entrepreneur to start to realize that, you know, there's some hard work and some intentionality, not just a quick fix, then usually we're in really good shape. And we can move forward with it. So sometimes I've got people that come in right out, out of the gate. I want to be a rocket ship. And if I talk to them like this and they're like, nope, then yeah, it's probably not a good fit. And they're going to go do whatever they want to do. 
And then there's other people that they already know this. They've tried a million times. They've been through three sales managers in two years. They've hired five people over the last 18 months and none of them have worked out. And they're just like, they're so frustrated because they don't understand why it's not working. So to me, you know, the clues are, are you in a mindset as a leader to look at things holistically and a little bit more intentionally than just, you know, going after some tactics? You said you, you specialize in uh, developing sales teams. So what are some of the unique challenges there? How do people, you know, shoot themselves in the foot or not uh, not grow how they want to, particularly within the sales team? Yeah. So a lot of times for me, it is, do you even have the right team on the bus? Are they in the right seats? Are they the right team? And what sometimes I find, I'll go through a couple of these, but one of the ones I usually find is I look at someone's job role. It's like that of five people. Now I, I deal with most companies in small, mid-sized businesses. So most of my clients are anywhere from maybe two to 5 million to 30 or 40 million. And they have a handful of salespeople to 10 or 15. So I'm kind of talking about that magnitude, not somebody working at Dell computers or something like that. But um, typically I look at their job role and it's like, there's no way this person can find new business, go to networking events, do outreach, work with marketing, grow a book of business, farm that business, ensure customer success, retain and grow. Like there's just not enough hours of the day. And, you know, and then, you know, you, when you pull back the covers, you go, how many meetings are you in? And they're like in five meetings a week. You're like, now you only have 20 or 30 hours to do this job. That's really three people. So sometimes it's not that you have the wrong person. It's that the expectations are too intense. But if we move from that, sometimes we have the wrong person. Somebody we have, somebody in sales, that's really good at selling themselves and telling you what you want to hear. And you hire them and you really wanted them to go out and do business development. They're kind of what would be called a hunter, but they prefer building relationships and they don't want to go out and meet people and they want to just grow the relationships they have and they don't want to cold call. They don't want to put themselves out there. And, and that's okay. Like, I'm not judging that. It's just, you hired the wrong person. And so a lot of times we've got people that can do a job, but they're in the wrong job. And when you think kind of hunter farmer, you've probably had these experiences if you're running a sales team. You thought this person was really great at talking to customers. Yeah, they are, but you better bring them the customers to talk to if you're relying on this person to go out and find them. They're not going to do it. So those are some of the things. Also, what I typically find with the team is the sales leader isn't holding the space or the meeting to bring out the best in people. Like when I run a sales meeting, we start with inspiration. You know, like we are there to inspire this group. Then we move to knowledge share. How do we learn from each other, right? And then I usually kind of play into some sort of action. How do we get into action in this meeting? And then how do we create accountability? And so if you're running meetings where people are showing up late, they're not turning on their Zoom camera, then you're probably not running high impact meetings. So how are you going to have a high, high impact team? So a lot of it gets back to, you've got this group of people that kind of play this individual sport, but also can work really well if they're seen as a team. And we're just not creating enough structure or clarity and maybe a job role. The tools, sales process may or may not be fully baked. And we might not be running effective meetings. We're not really bringing out the best in them. So a lot of times, those are the things I go in to fix. You, you, and, and it doesn't mean you don't have a good team. It just means sometimes we need to go in and, and tinker with it and start to make some changes and get people to adopt and be part of the change. Yeah, I've seen this in restaurants. You know, you'll get a cook that kind of was like a bully and a rat, and they take over everything. And then in you know, regular organizations, I've seen that salespeople can do the same thing. You know, if you get like a prima donna or someone that seems to be good at sales, I guess it, you know, if you don't watch out, you can, your organization may become hostage to them. Have you seen that? And, and if so, what do you do? Yeah, that is really astute. A lot of times, if we look at a sales team, you might have one or two lone wolves. They're really great at what they do. They kind of set the rules. They do whatever they want to do. They don't show up to the meetings and they're phenomenal salespeople. And if you have a culture where you can have a bunch of lone wolves and you're okay with just the outcome and they're not burning bridges and they're not tweaking your production team or your delivery team and they're not tweaking the marketing team and you can live with it, then, hey, lock it down. Cool. It works for you. But if you have a business where you're really trying to bring teams together and scale, kind of like how we began that conversation earlier, like if you really want to surrender to team and strategy, then I'm going to tell you probably need to start to find a new home for your lone wolves that are, that are killing it. Or you need to start to have some real conversations to see if they're willing to play ball and what that would look like. But yeah, I mean, I, I think ultimately when you come into a team, a sales team, you got to make sure they're, they're playing well with others and representing your brand and trying to solve things as a team. Because most people that run a sales organization want their team to be able to scale. And if you've got a 
if you don't have systems and processes or a, a code of conduct, a, a way we do things, it's going to be really hard to scale. And yeah, it's going to eventually feel like you're can be held hostage by two or three people because guess what? Every time you hire other salespeople, there's not enough of a process or a system or a team to support them and they fail. And here you are in the, kind of that hamster wheel again, where you just feel stuck. But that's the thing. I'm running yeah. into that a lot. I'm starting to think I don't want these superstars. I'd rather just have like people that are decent that will follow the procedures and the systems and all that. I, I don't want prima donnas. I don't want superstars. I'd rather have just like average people that do a decent job. Just, you don't have to fight with them and deal with them and their egos and all that stuff. I agree. I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not saying all your superstars are lone wolves. I'm just kind of calling out that if you can have a culture that supports one another, processes that people follow, even if it's 80%. And, you know, in general, you can see that people's close rates are pretty uniform across the team. They're, the way they work is relatively uniform across the team. I mean, people are still individuals and I support that, but that's going to get you down the field further. You know, you think about sports teams that win and, you know, very rarely is it where they have one superstar and they always throw the ball to that superstar and that's how they win the playoffs. Sometimes that happens, sure, but it's usually there's a combination of either people that support that superstar or a combination of multiple people on that team that all are at a high enough level that when you bring them together, it's not a one plus one equals two. It's like a one plus one equals three. And that's what we're after. And yeah, people that are just solid, good, smart people that have their heart in the right place and are aligned with their values with yours, you can have one heck of a team really fast, really fast, especially with the right leadership. Okay. Well, very good. How can people engage with you? Like what's the first way depending on their need and your availability? Like how can they reach you first of all? And, um, you know, what are some resources they can engage with to dip their toe in and, and get started? Awesome. Yeah. So I would say I have three books and that's probably a good way to kind of wade into the the pool or into things that you might've heard that you like. So Set Up to Win is my first book. It's really about foundations and frameworks to build a, a sales organization like we talked about. Second book is called Sales and Marketing Alignment. That's really about, hey, how do we get these two organizations, these two departments, if you will, sales and marketing work together? I see them as like twins. They, they Sometimes twins fight, but also sometimes twins can be like really great friends. So you want them to be that. You want them to be the twins that like, ha like hanging out with each other. And then my third book, Iceberg Selling, is really about how do you sell more effectively, communicate more effectively by looking at the bottom of the iceberg and, and understanding more and more of what's going on with people so that you can bring us be of service. So those are three really great resources. You can find them all on improving salesperformance.com. For me specifically, I, I, I speak at events, I run workshops, I've got a team of other consultants like myself, and we usually kind of come in at some level to take a company from A to B to move a team, to build a team, to improve a team. So I would just say reach out through improving sales performance, learn a little bit about us. If you're curious, send us a question. I answer every every question, every outreach, and also find my LinkedIn profile from going through that website. So improving salesperformance.com is ton of resources. And if you want to begin a conversation, I'd very much welcome it. Excellent. Well, Carl, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. I do too. Thank you for all the questions. They were really great. Now that you've heard from active business owners who have overcome serious challenges, consider implementing what you find useful to help your business not only survive, but thrive. Visit isurvivedbusinesspodcast.com.